More than one in three people will face cancer in their lifetime. Unfortunately, fear can stop you from getting cancer screening, but it won't stop cancer. Early detection can save your life. Don't wait for symptoms to appear to act. Cancer screening is safe, effective, and accessible for everyone, including free or low-cost screening programs. Go to cancerscreenquiz.com now and take the American Cancer Society's two-minute cancer screening quiz to find out what screening tests are right for you. Don't wait. Take the quiz. Get screened. Go to cancerscreenquiz.com now. Cancer Screen Quiz. Impact of Influence, the tragic story of a powerful South Carolina family and the mysterious deaths that they are linked to. Hello, friend. So glad you're joining us. Uh, my name is Matt Harris, and co-host Seton Tucker is directly in front of me in her chair with her microphone ready to go. And we admit we don't hit these things 100%. Sometimes we're reading information that turns out to be incorrect. Other times we just misspeak. So we love it when you set us straight, and then we set that right on an episode and this correction, Seton. Yeah, so just a little housekeeping. I kind of mixed up the relationship between Russell Lafitte and Jean, who also works for the bank. Uh, He's the one who release the statements. But we put a correction on our Facebook page. We have a family tree where you can see exactly how Russell and Jan are related. And for those who don't recall or didn't listen to the last episode, Russell Lafitte, Hampton Bank CEO of the Lafitte Family Bank, that that's another correction, was started in 1955. Originally, the report was it was started in the early 1900s, but Lafitte's bought the bank in 1955. And Russell Lafitte has been a fired as the CEO of Palmetto State Bank. Let's, uh, we're going to bring in John Snyder in a little bit, and also we're going to bring in, this is a great interview we had with Jay Bender, who's a retired law professor and attorney of the South Carolina Press Association, and Jay's a joy to talk to, and he breaks down what FOIA is, how FOIA has been used to gain information during this whole Murdoch mess and ways he believes that the media, and I should say the public even, is being stonewalled in their search for information on many of the things tied to Murdoch. So Jay Bender joins us in a bit. Let's begin, Seton, with the writ of habeas corpus. Yes, so this was denied by the South Carolina Supreme Court, and this goes back to the November bond hearing in which Judge Newman uh, did not give Alec Bond. Uh, so, John, I just wanted you to kind of break it down for us. What exactly does this mean? We were so used to having him on, we really don't realize that sometimes not everybody knows who the famous John Snyder is. He's the impact of influence legal analyst, former defense attorney, former district attorney, and people have been loving what you bring to the table, Snyder. So, uh, thanks for that. And let's, uh, the writ of habeas corpus, explain. I think we've said this before. It's the Latin translation for produce the body. And it is a legal mechanism where somebody with a claim can fast track their claim to get to the highest court in the land. So it's either the state Supreme Court or the United States Supreme Court, which seems like an eternity ago, but it was just a couple of months ago. Alex's attorneys wanted the Supreme Court of South Carolina to rule and declare unconstitutional the fact that he was initially denied bond. South Carolina Supreme Court has reviewed that petition. And the response from the state, and they have decided that the judge got it right. And so there's no habeas corpus uh, order issued. Next up, this really what seems like very inappropriate loan from the fired bank CEO, Russell Lafitte, to Alec Murdoch. Seaton. Right. So the Island Packet reported that Russell Lafitte, he was the banker we discussed earlier, he was fired from Palmetto State Bank. He served as a personal representative for a teenager from Estill who was injured in an accident. And then in 2011, I guess there was a settlement for about $58,000. Lafitte gave Ellick a loan of $40,000 out of this settlement. There was a promissory note saying that he would pay back the funds, but it was an unsecured loan, um, and it does not say what the funds were supposed to be used for. So when it's unsecured, John, correct me if I'm wrong, that means no collateral to back it up, even if Murdoch never pays. And that seems, on the surface, kind of messed up. You're dealing with somebody else's money. If this was a video, 
you would want to have red lights flashing, alarms going <laughs> off everywhere. Like this, this is where it just gets unbelievably egregious for how these guys were handling money that they had no business touching. We do need to note that the money was paid back a month later. According to the Island Packet, no real information about who paid the loan back is available. Why? What makes it so egregious that your person in charge of this guy's, this kid's money, loans it out? An attorney should never be borrowing money from a trust account that the, the party hasn't approved it or said that it was okay. Or let's say that it was legal. The propriety of doing that just does not pass the smell test. Especially when you add to the fact that the guy, Malik Williams, who was supposed to be getting this money, he was represented by Murdoch's former law firm, PMPED. Yeah, Murdoch wasn't representing him, but one of his law partners was. That gets a little incestuous here when the people representing someone and then they recommend this person to be the conservator and the person who's recommended gives money back to somebody in the law firm, right? That, that makes it extra weird, uh, messy, all those words. From someone that used to practice, it seems unimaginable the amount of financial transactions that occurred to benefit the Murdoch's compared to what really any other attorney who does that type of work would ever be able to get away with. It's almost inconceivable, the setup that these guys had. It's as if they had a firm meeting about, okay, what case is settled this week? And then when Alec heard, he would go over to the bank and be like, hey, I want to borrow money out of that settlement account. Yeah. Just, yes. It, it just sounds crazy. It sounds crazy until you see like, oh, well, here's a place where they never even paid out the, the part, their clients. Oh, here's another case where they questionable financial tri- transactions. Meanwhile, they're tooling around the low country and center console boats driving <laughs> German cars living on 1700 acre farms. Like, right. It, it, it just is stinks. John, can you kind of go over when a minor is involved in an accident exactly uh, what are the South Carolina rules about that? Yeah. So basically, to proceed in any court proceeding, you have to have parties that are all of the age of maturity who can make legal decisions. And so, but frequently you'll have children involved as a party. Uh, they're related to the case somehow. And so they get appointed a personal representative. Some people might think of that as a guardian ad litem. You know, it kind of goes by different names. That's essentially what it is. And it's somebody that's in the court on behalf of the named person to make legal decisions on their behalf. And how is that person chosen? Is it, can you pick a family member or is it typically a banker or it has to be someone independent from the family? No, it can be a parent. It can be a, it can be appointed it could be another lawyer. That's one of those things a lot of young lawyers do when they're first out of law school. Older lawyer will say, hey, we got a personal injury case and there were two kids in the car. Do you mind being one of the personal representatives? And it's, it's a nice way to make a couple hundred bucks, but it's, it's not uh, some big thing because typically the insurance companies are putting that money into a fund or in the clerk's office to be handled. It sounds like in these cases, instead of the clerk's office, it's being put in this guy's bank where it becomes a a piggy bank for the guys to do what they want with. Well, I thought this was kind of interesting. So one of my sleuth friends actually sent me the newspaper article where Russell Lafitte was in John Marvin's wedding. And John Marvin is Ellick's brother. We're seeing that there probably was a very friendly relationship between the two families. By the way, we should point out that Russell Lafitte has not been charged with anything, any criminal charges right now. All this is coming out based on the investigation into Alec Murdoch's financial misconduct by the South Carolina Supreme Court's Office of Disciplinary Investigations. Yeah. And explain what the uh, Office of Disciplinary Counsel is, John. 
So everybody that's a member of the bar is um, is subject to the authority and oversight of the South Carolina Bar, which is managed by the South Carolina Supreme Court, essentially. And so this investigative body has at its disposal subpoena power, interview power, all the things it needs to to make sure that attorneys are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Now, what's interesting is while they're doing their job, they're turning up all this other stuff about people that aren't lawyers and the transactions that lawyers were involved in and how was the bank using funds that were entrusted to them. So a trust account that a law firm sets up is technically not their property. It's the property of the client whose money is being held there. So the lawyer manages it on behalf of their their client. So so even though it's opened in the name of the attorney, it's actually your money if it was settlement funds from your auto accident case. And we point out that the the Office of Disciplinary Counsel has no authority over Lafitte or Westendorf or over bankers. They don't they're just revealing this, right? They they can't say something should be done to them. Oh no, that that's right, Matt. So speaking of Westendorf, there we've gotten a ton of questions about how he is possibly still employed by Palmetto State Bank. So I don't know. Anybody have any thoughts on that? <laughs> there's two possibilities. One is his name was used without his authority, and that's easily provable and was easily proved to law enforcement. That's option one. Option two is he was fully compliant and helped solve and answer all questions raised regarding the case. And so, you know, he's kind of done his civic duty. He's helped them find where wrongdoing occurred and has kind of met his moral obligation. The Island Packet, Buford Gazette, found out that the same Supreme Court disciplinary arm we've been talking about is investigating Alex Murdoch and the hunting property where Paul and Maggie's bodies were found. And they're not really sure exactly why they're probing into this. Barrett Thomas Bulware was the former owner and... Others in a subpoena sent to the Allendale County Probate Court in late November to find out more about this. We went records of the state files, Bulware and his mother, Ann Owens Bulware, and they went paperwork on that. And it's a 1,770-acre hunting property, as you, you may have heard in all our past episodes. And we don't know, is it financial crimes Murdoch may have committed against Bulware or for another reason? You know, it could be that he handled the estate and offered to buy the land from the bullware. You know, the lawyer's handling the estate and sees that they have this really nice piece of property that they'd like to own. And so they're, they say to him, hey, I'll buy this from you. That's a potential conflict of interest because you're now not putting the needs of your client first. You're putting your own needs ahead of, ahead of them. And Bullware, by the way, we talked about him in one of our earlier episodes. It was 2018 obituary. He talked about him being a commercial fisherman out of Buford. He owned it and transferred it to his wife in 09. And then Murdoch acquired it from his wife. And then at some point, Murdoch transferred it to Maggie. And Murdoch was also granted power of attorney by Bulware a couple of months before he died. And so Bulware and his dad, Barrett Bulware, faced drug smuggling charges. <laughs> about 15 tons of marijuana aboard a shrimp boat near the Bahamas. The charges were dropped after a key government witness was killed when he stepped in front of a car in Florida back in 83. So just another weird... Yeah. It's like everything is weird. Everything's weird in this story. Uh, John Snyder, once again, thank you very much, my friend. Thank you, guys. And let me know if you need anything else. Oh, I'm sure we will soon. <laughs> Thanks, man. All right, man. Talk to you later. Uh, talk about one of our sponsors in a second. Then after that, we're going to talk with Jay Bender, retired law professor, attorney of the South Carolina Press Association. He was a fabulous interview. Going to talk about FOIA and whether law enforcement has been holding back documentation that the public should see. That's coming up. We're going to pause for a moment and talk about Warby Parker. I've used Warby Parker for glasses for couple of years now so i'm so happy they're signing on as a sponsor for the podcast and seeing i know you love the try yes this is the first time i tried warby parker and i ordered my five pairs for free and you have five days to try them on there's no obligation to buy and they ship for free and they include a prepaid return label and 
I love the selection. I found out I have a wide face. Um, <laughs> and I the Daisy Wides were the ones that worked nice. best for me. And my husband complimented me on them, which is not like him to notice my <laughs> granny readers. And the glasses start at 95 bucks, including prescription lenses. Don't let your FSA or HSA dollars go to waste. Put them to good use on Warby Parker prescription glasses, prescription sunglasses, contact lenses, and eye exams. Try five pairs of glasses at home for free at warbyparker.com slash Murdoch. That's warbyparker.com slash M-U-R-D-A-U-G-H. And as we like to do in... Some of our episodes kind of get a, a macro and then micro look at certain things. Like we had a money laundering professor on. We had a professor who talked about Alex's grandfather's misuse of the death penalty. We had a guest on who was a professor talking about forensic accounting. And now we have the winner of the 2016 Lifetime Achievement Award from the South Carolina Press Association, retired law professor, attorney for the SC Press Association and the South Carolina Broadcaster Association. And he is Jay Bender. Hello, Jay. Good morning. Uh, so glad to have you. You are a perfect guest for this. You we're on the Oxygen special with Seton and I about Alec Murdoch. So I'm sure you've been following this. I know you've been involved. When people listen to podcasts and news, they hear often the acronym FOIA. And many people are unaware of what that is, I'm sure. Can you give us an overview of what FOIA is? Certainly. It's a, an abbreviation for Freedom of Information Act. And each state and the federal government has a separate piece of legislation. And in South Carolina, ours is divided into sections that deal with access to, to records, access to meetings, and then remedies when the law is violated. And our General Assembly in 1974, when it enacted the law, made a finding, which is unusual in South Carolina legislation, that it is vital in a democratic society that public business be performed in an open and public manner. And that's the goal of a statute that gives citizens access to public records and public meetings. You mentioned something there that I want to touch on for a second. The implication is that South Carolina was not one of the most, or is not, one of the more open states when it comes to public records and such. Is, am I reading you right? Well, we have an excellent statute, but what we have is a flawed political culture. It started in the colonial period when people from Barbados came to the colony. The white people from Barbados came to control a colony that was majority enslaved Africans. And their notion of governance was to make a decision and announce it and expect the enslaved Africans to accept it. And that political culture moved from the plantation to the mill village where the mill owners would make a decision and expect the mill workers to accept it. Now we don't have plantations and we don't have mills, but we have far too many elected officials who believe that they are our rulers and not our representatives, and they expect us to accept the decisions that are made in secret. And that's a very anti-democratic notion and inconsistent with our law. Well, I know you're a lobbyist with a, for the South Carolina Press Association, and there's been some changes in the laws. Can you kind of go over those? Well, I was a lobbyist uh, for about 40 years, but when I went full-time to teach at the university, I gave it up. But certainly there have been changes. Over the years, there have been efforts to strengthen uh, the citizen's right of access. This is a law not designed for reporters. This is a law designed for citizens. Oh. Uh, but in the most recent changes to the Freedom of Information Act, uh, the period a public body has to respond to the request from a citizen for records was shortened. But in return, the forces of darkness, uh, those public officials who wish to hide what they're doing, allowed charges to be made for redaction of information that does not have to be disclosed. And far too many public bodies in South Carolina use that as a mechanism to deter citizens from seeking records by demanding exorbitant costs to redact records and then release them. And I would hope that at some point in the future, the General Assembly will 
return to its commitment to open records that it had previously. The difficulty we have in lobbying for open records and open meetings in South Carolina, and I suspect elsewhere, is that it is generally press associations that push for open records and open meetings, and allied against that press push, you have groups that are publicly funded. In South Carolina, we have associations that are made up of municipalities, counties, law enforcement. All of these people want to keep their activities secret, and they fight tooth and tongue against any access improvement. And until we can get public support mobilized, I think we're going to continue to see an erosion of access to records. For years, our legislature and our Supreme Court were committed to access to records and access to meetings, but I have seen a retrenchment in the last several years, and I think it was interesting you had the podcast on money laundering. I think the General Assembly and our Supreme Court have endorsed a mechanism for money laundering by private groups that receive public funds in the form of accommodations taxes, and then they seem to launder that money through consultants and agencies, and when they get a rebate or refund, they think it's private money and they make political contributions with it. Now, who would be (laughs) most in favor of that and that's the people receiving the contribution. So, uh, <laughs> yep. I think, to, and they in the past seem to have been members of the General Assembly or candidates uh, for state office. And I think that until we change that dynamic in our culture, we're not going to have true democracy in South Carolina. Um, let's uh, zero in on a little bit of Murdoch stuff right now. And in July, I believe it was, the Post and Courier Charleston newspaper entered a lawsuit against Colleton County sheriffs, I believe, and SLED to get information on the Paul and Maggie Murdoch murders. And they did eventually get stuff, but it was quite heavily redacted. Let's start from what does the Post and Courier do? How do they, who do they present the lawsuit to? How long does it take to get a, a that lawsuit heard and these kind of things? And what came out of it? The reason for the lawsuit was that both the state law enforcement division, SLED, and the local law enforcement agencies in the low country were refusing to release any information. And our law is quite specific that certain types of information, including that in police reports, must be released when a citizen goes to the office of that law enforcement agency and asks to see the records. There's no written request required, and you should be entitled to walk in and see police reports for the previous 14 days. The Colleton County Sheriff's Department refused to release any information, and SLED prevented a reporter from the Post and Courier from even getting in the building uh, to ask for the police reports that SLED had in its possession. And as a consequence, the Post and Courier filed suit. Now, we have a mechanism that accelerates suits for public records, and the presiding judge or the chief administrative judge in a circuit has an obligation to act within a limited number of days to set a hearing. Now, the hearing doesn't have to be within a set number of days, but Uh, The General Assembly has said that this law must be interpreted to facilitate access. So the hearing was held relatively quickly in the Charleston Post and Courier suit against SLED and the Sheriff's Department. And in that case, the law enforcement agencies came to the judge and presented the records that were in those agencies' possession and persuaded the judge that an exemption from mandatory disclosure applied. And that exemption is that the release of the information would interfere with a prospective law enforcement action. And it's very difficult for a judge to go against a law enforcement agency that says, 
if this information is released to the public, it's going to compromise what we're doing trying to solve this heinous crime. And the judge upheld the redaction of much of the information, but the law enforcement agencies provoked the lawsuit by failing to follow the provision in the law that says where you have a public record that has information that must be disclosed and information that may be withheld, the public body has the obligation to segregate the information and make that which is to be disclosed available. But in this instance, neither agency until sued released any information. What do you think about the amount of information that was redacted from the reports that were released? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm always skeptical when everything is redacted. <laughs> uh, and I'm particularly skeptical when there does not seem to be any prospective law enforcement action taking place. And I see law enforcement agencies that will attempt to use that exemption from mandatory disclosure even after the investigation has been completed. Wow. So it's we have two groups in South Carolina that are particularly resistant to providing the public with information. And one is school boards and school districts, and the second would be law enforcement agencies. Well, DNR released all of their information in regards to the Mallory Beach boating accident. What are your experience with the different law enforcement agencies in South Carolina? And I want to piggyback on Seton with that. Was SLED and Colleton County, I don't know if you're familiar with what they're doing, but does it line up with how they've treated other cases? Were they less forthcoming with information, perhaps because it was the Murdoch family? I can't attribute any particular motive to any of those law enforcement agencies. I would suspect that knowing who uh, was involved, that that may have had some influence, but that's only supposition. SLED has a long history of restricting access to public records. In fact, it got sued years ago because it took the position that all of its investigative files were confidential, and the Supreme Court rejected that notion and said, if you want a blanket exemption, you have to get it from the General Assembly. You can't, on your own motion, declare that all of your material is confidential. The Colleton County Sheriff's Department, like many sheriff's departments, doesn't want to release any information about anything <laughs> unless somehow the release of that information will make the agency look good. Sure. And where you have a violent act resulting in two people dead on the ground, you would think that there could be some information that would be released by local law enforcement. What I found particularly amazing in this case was that the sheriff's department was assuring people in the community that there was no risk to the community, but never once identified who might be a suspect. Huh. At, the same, at the same time this was going on, there was uh, a fugitive loose in Lancaster County in the upper part of South Carolina, and the law enforcement agencies went public with that information, urged a lockdown, and told the public that there was risk and who they were looking for. Well, if there's no risk, explain that. Yeah, And I, I've never understood how the police could make a blanket assurance like that without giving any background information. And so I got some information from Sarah Holstein Graves, who's been on our podcast before, and she uh, helped us out with some great questions. And one thing she sent me was from April 2020, where you're talking about the attorney general's office uh, had given a recent direction to coroners. And in that, they say an individual's right to privacy does not survive the person. Explain that in relation to Maggie's death certificate not being released. There are restrictions on releasing birth certificates and death certificates because of concern for identity theft. But the notion is that the exemption in our statute, our Freedom of Information statute, for unreasonable invasion of personal privacy has no application when one is dead, because our Supreme Court has said that you interpret that exemption from disclosure in the context of the common law right of action for invasion of privacy. And in South Carolina, 
the right of privacy dies with the person. So uh, for a law enforcement agency or a coroner to say, I can't release the cause of death because it would be an unreasonable invasion of personal privacy is a misunderstanding of the law at best and a cover up at worst. Have you heard anything about why Maggie's death certificate has not been released? And do you know of any current FOIA lawsuits that are going on surrounding any of this? I don't know why the death certificate hasn't been released or any information uh, about her death. Uh, I know that there is uh, one case that says a coroner's report uh, does not have to be released because our Supreme Court concluded that an autopsy report, uh, not a coroner's report, an autopsy report, I'm sorry, an autopsy report is a medical record. Uh, I've said, yeah, people are dying to get into that practice. <laughs> and uh, the danger from that case is that in that instance, the autopsy report released by the coroner was inconsistent with the autopsy report released by a private medical examiner for the person who was killed by the police. So I think it enhances public confidence in law enforcement if law enforcement releases records and those records are consistent with the claims being made by law enforcement. But I don't know of, I don't know of any suits that are outstanding Andy. currently. I think the post and courier suit has been concluded. So just curious, uh, just on not not related to the Murdoch case, but have you ever won a FOIA case that you later kind of felt bad about because you felt like you infringed too much on someone's personal privacy? Never. Never? Because these suits these suits are after public records. Yeah. And our law has been clear since the nineteen fifties that you have a diminished expectation of privacy when you are involved in any manner with the government. And if your information is to be included in a public record, for example, our leading case going back into the 50s concerned the birth of a child to a very young mother. The mother and the father of the child sued for invasion of privacy when their names and ages were published in a newspaper. And the Supreme Court said, well, the names and ages of the parents go on the birth certificate. That's a public record. So there is no right of privacy. I will say this, that I, I've litigated Freedom of Information Act cases since 1975. And the only ones I regret are the ones I've lost. <laughs> because, because I think that it requires openness by our government agencies to maintain the confidence of the public in the legitimacy of what the government is doing. Well, you've won all these awards and everything, and I want to know what's your big win, Jay. Jay Bender, what, what, is, what is the one? If someone, you know, you went on your uh, the top of your head or of your story of your life, what's, what's your big victory? I've raised four children that are doing well in life, although one of them is a reporter and I worry about him. <laughs> and I, uh, I have uh, eight grandchildren and two great-grandchildren. Those are my greatest victories. Oh, there you go. Well, also, uh, Sarah told me a couple of fun facts about you, that you are an artist and you've had some art shows and that you've ridden across the country on a motorcycle. Well, I do paint and I have had some shows uh, and I've enjoyed it. I can't draw a thing, so my paintings are abstract. <laughs> and yes, I have ridden across the country five times on a motorcycle. Oh. The most insane trip was from Columbia, South Carolina to Key West, Florida to Prudhoe Bay, Alaska and back. What? And, the, and then I, it's the ultimate cross country. And then I did one that was all four corners, the lower 48 states, uh, Key West, Florida, San Ysidro, California, Blaine, Washington and Madawaska, Maine. Jeez. But but I, I have retired from uh, riding motorcycles, unfortunately. I retired from racing involuntarily some years before that when uh, I was injured in a crash where my racing instincts outran my racing ability. <laughs> Dwayne's wondering what kind of bike you, you rode. Well, on those epic trips, it was a BMW GS Adventure made for a, a long haul and a variety of road surfaces. Of course, uh, once you get above Fairbanks in Alaska, uh, you're on gravel 
that's built up above the permafrost. So uh, you really need some off-road capability on your bike. But most of the cross-country trips were on uh, BMWs, although I did have one. The first one I took was on a, a smaller 750cc Honda. A nice bike, but just not quite big enough for what I did. And then I had a, another trip that I had a 1200cc Honda Twin, which was a nice bike for cruising down the road. But once you got off the pavement, pavement it got pretty squirrely. So I, I went to the GS Adventures for my insane trips. And how was your derriere after that long trip? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I, I know you guys plug uh, Warby Parker, but I'll plug Boudreaux's butt paste. <laughs> <laughs> Boudreaux's butt paste. And I, I wanted to mention your voice. You have a very nice voice, and I've been told that you were a reader for the South Carolina Network for the Blind. I was. I was a volunteer for about 20 years until South Carolina decided that it no longer needed to operate a reading service for the blind. I thought it was a terrible policy decision, and it was a wonderful experience. I would actually run from my house early on a Tuesday morning to the studios at the Commission for the Blind, read newspapers into a tape recorder for about an hour and a half, and then run home. So I would get an hour and a half or so of public service and a six-mile run Nice. Uh, each Tuesday, but the state of South Carolina decided that that service was no longer necessary. I think it's a shame. I think people benefited greatly from it, not only the people who heard us, but the people who read. Uh, my husband's an ophthalmologist, so he would definitely agree with you. He has he treats a lot of elderly patients with macular degeneration, so he would definitely agree with you. Yeah, I, I thought it was a great service, and uh, I enjoyed doing it. Uh, thanks a lot, Jay. Really appreciate it. Jay Bender with us. And that was a really great conversation. Keep up the good fight. Oh, oh, thank you. It was a pleasure being with you. Thank thanks, you. Jay. Bye. Ah, pleasure talking to that guy. That was cool. Uh, we have an email from Tina. She sent it to Matt Harris Podcast at gmail.com. She lives in Mount Airy and she wanted to reach out and say that she's on episode 22. And I love y'all's podcast and the way you both give us information. Keep doing what y'all are doing. Thanks for being informative. So uh, appreciate that. If they want to find us, reach out to us. You can reach us on our Facebook page, which is Murdoch Podcast, or on our website, which is MurdochPodcast.com. And we'd love for you to follow. So the episodes just show up on your podcast feed. And we'd love you to share the podcast. And we will talk soon. More than one in three people will face cancer in their lifetime. Unfortunately, fear can stop you from getting your cancer screening, but it won't stop cancer. Early detection can save your life. Don't wait for symptoms to appear to act. Cancer screening is safe, effective, and accessible for everyone, including free or low-cost screening programs. Go to CancerScreenInfo.com right now for free screening resources and recommendations from the American Cancer Society. Don't wait. Early detection can save your life. Go to CancerScreenInfo.com today. CancerScreenInfo.com dot com.